Okay, so hello everybody. Um, welcome to my new channel. So, I am really excited about this. You may know me from my other channel, which is called Summer XO. However, I'm wanting to start this new one as well. I'll still be uploading on the other one to do true crime cases as is my true passion and I just wanted to keep the two channels separate for many different reasons. YouTube don't like it when you're a whole channel and also talking about, you know, true crime. So I just thought I'd make a new channel so make sure you subscribe, all that good stuff. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep touching my hair, I'm about to get that sorted. But, oh, I did it again. Anyway, um, I'm gonna also, I'm not I'm not gonna be one of them people that do their makeup with every true crime case. I mean, I might do it. There's a few people that I watch that do do it. I'm not sure who originally started the doing makeup and true crime at the same time, but I know quite a few people that do it. And I thought, you know what? It gives me something to do whilst I'm talking about it, but I'm not gonna be mentioning the makeup. I will maybe leave links down below, but it's, I'm not gonna mention the makeup because I want to focus on the cases. So I'm just really, really excited for this new venture. And yeah, so let's get started. So this case today is an absolutely horrific one. It is the Baby P case. So this is probably one of the biggest child cases in the UK and for good reason, because it's absolutely horrendous. I've got my little mini mouse hairband on. So it happened in 2007, so not even, that was the year my sister was born. I was about, f how old would I have been? Three years old, so obviously I don't remember it, but I've known about this case for a few years now, and it's always just really, really done my head in, and you'll see why as I tell you all what happened in this horrendous case. But I just do want to give a disclaimer because we are talking about the killing of a baby and child abuse and all of that just absolutely disgusting stuff so if you can't listen to that just click off please don't don't upset yourself so baby p who was born as peter connolly that's just kind of the nickname for the case the baby p case but he is called peter i'll be referring to him as both in this video he was born in 2006 on the 1st of March to his mother Tracy Connolly and his father who is just not known like he's completely unnamed we'll go more into that in a second when I go back to Peter's the beginning of Peter's life because obviously we do need to discuss the mother in this case which is Tracy Connolly the sick disturbed twisted woman i need to talk about her childhood first i'd really like to go into the childhoods of these disgusting perpetrators um because it does make you i i, I always find it interesting and no it doesn't give an excuse at all because obviously it just doesn't it kind of just gives you an inkling of why they did it which there is no reason why anyone should do anything as sick as this however if you watch true crime, you know what I mean. Everyone is always interested in the childhood. So Tracy Connolly, previously Tracy Cox, was born in Leicester, 29th of June, 1981. So as you can imagine, her childhood was very, very complex. And um, her mother, Mary O'Connor, well, she was called Mary Cox at this point. Her, Mary O'Cox, and she was a big big drug and drink abuser so she was not the best mother at all in any way shape or form and she was married i think they were married to someone called gary cox who tracy actually believed to be her father um so she believed this was her real father she was never told any different anyway gary was very violent and abusive and tracy witnessed a lot of domestic abuse between her father and her mother. Tracy also had a half brother, not sure of his name, he was four years older than Tracy and their house was said to be completely unhygienic, dirty constantly and from a very young age Tracy and her brother were left completely alone, unsupervised and it was just a simple case of just horrible parenting and parents that shouldn't have children. Mary and Gary, so Tracy's mother and who she believed to be her father, actually separated in 1984 and Tracy and her mum moved from Leicester to London. However, 
Tracy's half brother stayed with his dad, which Tracy also believed was her dad. So that kind of, you know, they lived apart. She even called this man dad. She, I'm sure she, she loved him. I mean, there was lots of the domestic abuse, obviously, but I'm sure besides that, she did love him. Cause obviously when you're that young, you don't understand what's going on. I'm pretty sure they still saw each other. This wasn't too clear, but I think they did anyway. At the age of 12, Mary actually decided to inform her daughter Tracy that in fact that was not her dad and she was the product of a one night stand. So imagine you're 12 years old, you're a, you're, you're a ripe preteen and the person you believed to be your father is just not and you, just, your dad's just you know some one night stand guy you know it's not good it's not good in the later years tracy actually um told people that she was went a bit wild during this time and she wanted to try and find her father but i don't really know what happened along them lines but she was just you know clearly was desperate to have her father and at this point obviously tracy's relationship with her family was breaking down especially her mother it would wouldn't it and also tracy claimed she was being physically abused i'm going to say claimed as this has not been proved but also she could completely be telling the truth she could completely be lying we do not know it's also said that tracy's biological father is a convicted paedophile Anyway, Gary Cox died in 1988, which obviously was very sad and even sad for Tracy because she called him dad, you know, even though she knew now he wasn't her dad. It, that meant that her half-brother actually came to live with them in London because obviously he couldn't stay in Leicester without his dad who had died. And apparently the brother had tremendous struggles with settling down uh, i can imagine i mean his father died his mother was a drunk and a drug abuser I, I can imagine it was horrendous he was reportedly violent at school and towards his sister tracy again this girl's not having the best of luck is she at all one childhood friend from tracy's primary school actually remembered tracy as well this is a quote from her she was the kid at school that no one wanted to play with she was plump dirty and would turn up at school in shoes that were always falling to bits and old tracksuit bottoms. Children called her Tracy the Tramp because she was so scruffy. She was always getting up, beaten up by other kids and always had a bump on her lip or, you know, which is just horrible. I mean, here I'm talking about Tracy as a child, not what she goes on to do, but that is, why are kids like that? Like, not everyone has money you know so tracy obviously being fatherless and very lonely and she was just craving that attention she was very promiscuous from a young age because she was craving that attention from men boys and obviously she wasn't getting substantial attention at home which was just awful from 1991 until june 1992 tracy was placed on the child protection register due to neglect and physical abuse social services remained involved with the family and tracy was sent to farney clothes which was a boarding school this is in west sussex and it's for children with you know special educational needs or behavioral issues she actually sat and passed her gcse's in english and it and she also worked in the hairdressers for a short time so tracy was actually a abused by a male relative who was part of a paedophile ring. He was a teenage pimp helping to run a care home in this paedophile ring in Islington and this child had also been at the hands of abuse from others in this ring. There was actually a child abuse scandal that put like that was going around Islington at the time and it was unknown to the wider world they were in the grip of a paedophile ring targeted children that wasn't being checked by authorities. Back to Tracy, she left school at age 16 and she instantly met Peter, baby P's father. He was a railway worker and at this time, remember she's 16, Peter's father was 33. I mean, sources say this is a great nice man, but I mean, mm, that does not sit right with me. So a year passed before they moved into a council house together in Tottenham and Tracy gave birth to three daughters, still with the ma the same man, the railway worker. We don't know his name, by the way. Um, but yeah, anyway, she had them pretty, you know, boom, 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 like baby, baby, baby. And then shortly after, she had her son, 
Peter Connolly, who is baby P. He was a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous little boy. He has the sweetest face. And again, we don't know his three sisters' names. There's no photos, which, you know what, good. I'm glad they're protected. So she obviously gave birth to him on the 1st of March, 2006. And Tracy and the kid's father's, the, the kid's father, they were married as well at this point. Peter was just three months old when Tracy actually split up from his father all the kids father and apparently this was because lots of arguments about the lack of housework going on and also apparently she was having flings with men online which i really wouldn't put past her to be honest by all accounts peter's father is actually described really well i mean besides the fact he got with a 16 year old when he was 33 apparently he was a loving father and we don't really know why he had four kids with tracy because probably because she is very very manipulative Basically, we're also, before we get started into the abuse and the horrific events of today's case, we also have two other people that are quite relevant in this case, so I thought I'd just quickly mention them before I get into the full timeline of events. Shortly after Tracy split up with Peter's dad, she met a person called Stephen Barker. They became friends and then eventually began a relationship. Stephen Barker, he was born in June 1976, so he was five years older than her, you know, a bit of a less weirder age gap this time. And he went to a special school in Tottenham. That is not me calling it a special school, by the way, guys. That was straight off a quote from the internet, just saying. And apparently had an IQ of 60, so... Oh dear. He actually claimed to be unable to read and write during he like during when he was having his trial, but the police literally could see he could because of texts he'd sent. He was in fact six foot four and eighteen stone. He was a massive guy, which which is absolutely huge. He was obsessed with knives, crossbows, martial arts weapons, collection of swastika swastika memorabilia so you know bit of an odd guy i can't lie but you know bit odd yeah he used to stride around his home no joke in combat gear so clearly he thinks he is very very cool which he's definitely not and this is just he as a child he used to torture animals which oh, we all know that is never a good sign don't we um, but he apparently tortured guinea pigs and frogs, skinning them before breaking their legs. He actually went to keep, he kept two pet snakes at Tracy's home and fed them dead chicks, mice and rabbits. And his fascination, his, fas his fascination with causing pain to animals actually led him to be prosecuted by the RSPCA, thank God. So anyway, he doesn't move into the house straight away but he does a few months after. And also another person in this case who doesn't move into a lot later, but still relevant, is a guy called Jason Barker, who then changed his name to Jason Owen, just due to legal reasons. And he actually was dating a 15 year old at the time. Keep in mind, Jason, okay, was older than Stephen. So he must have been, you know, fairly a lot older, which is just not the age, she's not even the age of consent, like, come on, man. And they both, okay, this is very important, they actually escaped convictions for torturing their own grandmother to get her to change her will. I'm not sure of the details, but they actually got let off in the end because she died of pneumonia before the case came to court. So I guess lucky for them. So he actually moved in with Tracy in November 2006. So baby Peter was only a few months old at this point, obviously. And their first home was in Hermitage Road in Tottenham. It was described by social workers as damp, full of urine, because it's it's stunk of urine. And then eventually they moved to um, a church housing association property in nearby Penhurst Road, which they shared with their family Rottweiler, German Shepherd and Staffordshire, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. And this is the house where sadly most of this case takes place, which is horrendous. So from what 
I can recall from a couple of months old she would go to the doctors just with very small things to do with Peter very like bruises or whatever so obviously you know a kid, a kid could be doing that but there's nothing really big around this time however it kind of starts largely in September 2006 so he would have been April, May, June, July, August. he would have been six months old so this is their first recorded like important appointment on the 18th of September in 2006 Tracy took Peter to the GP surgery with a nappy rash and a cough you know pretty an average thing for a child to have and the GP recorded that in the course of the consultation she complained that her baby Peter bruised really easily and she was scared that she might be accused of hurting him i mean i don't really know why you'd bring that one up if like that just already screams guilty to me a month later on the 13th of october 2006 she then brought in peter again saying he'd fallen down the stairs the previous day the gp examined him and his bruising he had one on like his left breast and cranium and he advised he, he literally just advised Tracy to get a stair gate because to be fair at this point you know it wasn't too serious or something out of this world you know but then again like surely you should ask some questions like how does a child fall down like how does a child that young fall down the stairs like it can't even walk yet like he, he's seven months old what is he doing and also who doesn't even put a stair gate in when if their kid's crawling this do this doctor did not pursue this any further which I, I don't know it's a bit controversial because it is still quite at the beginning but still this did reach like the risk for significant harm and social services should have been involved even at this early on stage because they because it's such a young child who literally fell down the stairs they would need to go the show, social services should go and investigate they should see you know maybe what caused oh maybe what caused him to fall down and see if the family need any help with safety you know pretty innocent right, when peter was about eight months old stephen barker the boyfriend moves in which is just not good at all and tracy actually hid this massively from social services like they did not know he was living there basically right, a month later tracy took Peter to the GP yet again with a swelling on his head which she said she noticed whilst he'd been in the care with Tracy's mum remember Mary so Peter's grandmother I mean we don't know if this is true but knowing what we know it probably isn't because Tracy is a monster and a liar anyway a hospital referral was made and a number of bruises were found on his body and as the Injuries appear to be non-accidental referrals made to social workers. I know what you're thinking. Yes, good. Yes. A strategy meeting was actually held the next day and a decision was made that he could not return to the family home until the section 47 inquiries and police investigation was completed. On 11th of December 2006, she took her son to Whitting Hospital. There was actually a number of bruises that could be seen on him and that just didn't sit right with them and tracy says she did not know how any of these happened but maybe it was when you know he was playing and clearly he can bruise easily you know that that was it that was her explanation he has extensive bruising to his bum and face cheeks chest the test results indicate that he was not suffering with any condition which would mean that he would be susceptible to bruising easily so i mean that ruled that one out she clearly didn't know they could test things like that. On the 13th of December, police officers and social workers made a joint visit to the school to visit two of the older children, so Peter's older siblings. They were seen separately and neither of them showed any concerns about their safety. Clearly they were, you know, doing fine. Or they could have been lying, like, obviously, because kids get scared. And whilst under this review, he stayed in hospital based on his injuries and obviously Tracy's story just really not matching up. Four days later, Peter was discharged and placed in the care of a family friend until, you know, they investigated into what on earth Tracy was doing. 
or if she was doing anything. And this is good, like they're doing something. During this investigation, Tracy and Tracy's mum, so Peter's grandmother, actually got arrested for assaulting him. So they did something right here. And right now you're probably all thinking, oh, like it's going so well. Like, yeah, we have authorities stepping in, it's all good. An initial child protection conference of the agencies involved was held on the 22nd of December, 2006. The GP did not attend because he was not invited. I mean, I'm pretty sure he should go, surely, because he's the one that's been seeing Peter, but whatever. They clearly just didn't care enough. The paediatrician from the Whittington Hospital was invited, but gave her apologies and said she can't really make it. I mean, pretty, pretty key event. But she did contribute a detailed written report. Nobody was sent instead of her, already failing here. And a doctor from the Child Development Centre was also invited, but gave apologies he couldn't come either. Anyway, the social worker rep the social worker presented a report that included information about Tracy's background history obtained from LB in Islington. So her childhood and stuff. So a legal representative of the local authority was also present and Tracy also bought a legal representative. I'm surprised she even knew how to get one, but here we are. And the police were represented by an investigating police officer. The investigators into the injuries of Peter was continuing the police says that they understood that Peter would not be returned home until the police investigation was completed. But apparently this was not recorded. Tracy was completely unable to give an explanation of how her baby had these injuries, which is completely ridiculous and makes me angry because it was so obvious she was doing something. Peter had a really good relationship with his father and obviously we still don't know his name, but this was completely evident to them because Peter actually went for a bone scan and it was only his father that could like calm his distress which is really sweet and it shows he you know trusted and loved his father a lot lot more which is actually really strange because babies you usually always want their mothers like i'm not just being biased that's like an actual fact like when a baby's ill they want their mum you know it's just a, it's just a thing so clearly that is a huge red flag in summary the conference concluded that these injuries were clearly not an accidental and that was quite obvious and no adult could explain how he got these injuries this was very concerning for a nine month old baby like if he's getting all these injuries like by accident surely someone would know what would happen like surely someone would have known so peter was eventually registered like on the social services for physical abuse and neglect however none of his other siblings were because obviously they were showing perfectly okay signs of being safe and you know not affected by this so following this original like meeting about baby p's safety there was actually regular social services like social worker meetings visitations and from the health visitors and the older children were actually seen almost daily during the week as they attended school regularly so what was seen between the mother and the girls was a you know a positive relationship keep in mind i'm pretty sure he was staying with the family friend still at this point but i'm not 100 percent sure the family friend who was looking after peter and who peter was staying with actually reported seeing bruises on his testes and but then she claimed that these were the hospital because they had to scan them so obviously they had to touch them see this is what's weird I don't, i'm not sure if this friend was like protecting tracy but we don't know like she could have not had a literal clue like it's quite i have a feeling that she was completely manipulated by tracy because why would she want to look after her son for her you know like it just it confuses me that one a little bit but i'm pretty sure she probably wasn't all right person she just wasn't aware of what was going on in the home which is such a shame social workers actually visited the home that he was staying in on the 24th the 27th and the 29th of december so it was very frequent visits and tracy also visited her son three times on christmas day i'm not sure why three times like did she keep just going out i don't know so the first core group meeting was held in january 2007 and tracy actually was attended with baby peter and a review strategy meeting was held on the 24th of january and it was decided that baby peter can 
and just go home. And it was agreed that if the inj injuries were non-accidental, it was clear no one knew who the perpetrator was. How, how was that clear? How, was, how is that clear in any way, shape or form? Anyway, they agreed that Tracy could have her son back. Peter could return back into Tracy's care just as long as the dogs went, honestly. I mean, that didn't really seem like an in-depth review, but baby Peace Hut returned home on the 26th of January and the, this is when they moved to their other home I was telling you about, the second house. Over the next month, all the children were seen by another GP in the practice and they were judged to be well and happy. There was a social worker visit on the 24th of February. All the children were seen and the social worker observed, observed that there was a good relationship between mother and children. So Tracy, you know, was good. This was even, it was even said that she had a good relationship with Peter. But on the 5th of March, the school nurse actually phoned the social worker saying that that day she had witnessed Tracy loudly shouting and slapping the cheek of one of her kids so not peter because obviously he's too little to be at school but one of his older sisters we're not obviously sure which one we don't even know their names and the sibling was seen alone and the sibling confirmed the assault tracy had already agreed to attend a parenting program at the school so the social worker thought mm, no further action needed even though this woman's already you know been seen for other child abuse allegations and arrested for it like what? On the visit to the home on the 5th of, the, of March and the 8th of March, the social worker said that Peter was seen happy and smiling. I mean, you can't really just say he's fine because he's happy and smiling. He's a toddler. Like, he isn't aware really what's going on, is he? He's not even a toddler, he's a baby. He can't even walk. On the 13th of March, the social worker interviewed baby Peter's dad. And this was the first time that seen since the December admission to the Whittington Hospital. And basically the father wanted more contact with his children and he was advised by the social worker to get legal advice. He said that Tracy had a boyfriend, so he told that Tracy had a boyfriend, thank God someone told, and that he'd seen him in the family home. Later, Tracy angrily denied this to the social worker, but also Peter's dad said that he does not think Tracy would hit the children. So clearly he had a different idea of her. At the review child protection conference on the 16th of March, the social worker wants to increase the frequency of the announced and unannounced home visits weekly. The plan now was for monthly contact with the health visitor either at the home or at the clinic. Visit to the PCMHW on the 23rd of March. Tracy was actually angry and upset about all these like unsurprised visits from the social worker because apparently it was disturbing her time with her son and her family. I mean surely if you want to clear your name let them come and then just get rid of you off the protection thing. And another core group meeting was held on the 29th of March 2007. See I'm just thinking they're having all these meetings, like they're having all these meetings and nothing's been done. Like what are they sitting and talking about these meetings, like what they had for lunch? I don't understand. At 4.40pm on the 9th of April, again Peter is taken to the A&E this time by Tracy, his mother. And this is North Middlesex um, Hospital. The nurse noted a large boggy swelling on the left side of his head. Tracy's account was that four days earlier it had been pushed against a marble fireplace by another kid, like playing, you know, another kid his age. Apart from being grisly and a bit grumpy, over the next two days he'd seemed fine, but he'd woken up that morning with neck pain, holding his head to one side. So that's why she came in eventually. He had a small round bruise on his right cheek, a rash on the back of his arm and obvious head lice. Tests were done for meningitis because of the rash and the neck stiffness, although this was completely ruled out, he did not have meningitis. Body map indicated bruises and scratches on his face and body, which, you know, can't really be done by being pushed into a fireplace. Apparently, Tracy said that she actually had proof for this, like, because she had a friend in the waiting room that apparently witnessed this fall, and it's now said that people think that this friend was actually her boyfriend, Stephen Barker. Peter was admitted to a ward for 48 hour observation. A man referred to as his father was present on two evenings but didn't stay. However, Tracy stayed with him during the whole 48 hours. I mean, she's got to keep that good mum act on, of course. But there's no one knows who was caring for the other kids at this time. The hospital nurse confirmed to the social worker that the child had been brought in because he was injured 
by that it was not viewed as non-accidental because the mother had stated that the injury had been caused by another child. By this time, there was no sign of the original injury. The social work team agreed the discharge, no referral was made to the police. <sighs> God, it's just like all these incidents. Peter was discharged home on the 11th of April, 2007. Discharge report of 17th of April from the hospital referred to Tracy reporting a trivial head injury caused by playing with siblings a few days before the admission. The social worker next visited the home on the 24th of April and, he, and they saw Peter playing with the other children, having fun, you know, happy he was smiling like he was fine he was clean and well dressed so the next time the social worker came it was clear to them that peter was very unsteady on his feet on the 1st of june the social worker made an unannounced visit to the home and actually noticed a bruise on peter's chin tracy said it was caused in a school ball with another child of a friend and the social worker requested that Tracy take Peter to the GP. So he was taken to A&E at the North Middlesex University Hospital. And obviously these are aware that he is on the child protection register. At the hospital, a history was taken. Tracy's account was that a friend had been staying between the 25th and the 28th of May. And she thought that the bruises were caused by a rough play with her friend's 22 month old child. There was a grab mark bruise on Peter's lower right leg that the doctors were cons very concerned about but she said that she'd grabbed him on his leg to prevent him from falling off the sofa I mean that's a pretty hard grab, come on now but, but she didn't mind him falling down the stairs before anyway, the social worker was happy for Peter to be discharged home you know, just, oh we're very concerned but you know what, bye even though you, you know, you're, with, you're on the child protection thing huh? what? the police were actually convinced that the injuries were non-accidental Okay, we'll, you know, do something, get in there quicker then. And they suggested that a strategy meeting needed to be arranged. And this did take place on the 4th of June, 2007. Agreement was reached to hold an urgent legal planning meeting to consider the care proceedings for Peter. So the proceedings that were obviously put in place were that they needed to fast track a paediatric assessment. They needed to make arrangements for Peter to be supervised at the family home by the family friend and to find a childminder to assist at, with childcare during the day and also a joint investigation by the police and so children's social care was ongoing. Tracy was actually interviewed by the police and she gave various ideas of how Peter could possibly have got his injuries and the police did not take any of this further so you know it's just bye bye you can go back home but you know as long as the family friend's there you're fine. 5th of June, Tracy and this family friend met the team manager to sign a written agreement to the effect that Tracy and baby P would not ever be alone together and that this family friend would, you know, have to be there. And there would also be a childminder for baby P on particular days to help out. The agreement was to be reviewed in two weeks' time. I mean, that's pretty fast. The police felt that while their investigation was going on into the injuries that Peter should not be staying with his mother, which, I mean, thank God. On the 8th of June 2007, the Review Child Protection Conference was held. The social worker told the events of the injuries about them on the 1st of the June and said that they could not be explained by Tracy's ridiculous accounts. The meeting was informed that a legal planning meeting was to be held within the next week to inform future decision making. What are all these planning things doing in place? Like Peter's just, you know, poor Peter, like let's just all sit and chat. Anyway, the conference chair expressed his concerns that Peter was experiencing way too many of the same injuries in sporadic time to be, you know, proof that it was an accident or caused by another child. If it was per Peter's own behaviour that caused these injuries, like his mother claimed, then these injuries should be occurring continuously rather than intermittently. On the 29th of June, the social worker had a message from the childminder that Tracy had actually just, you know, left with Peter. They'd just gone. And the social worker tried to contact Tracy on three occasions that day without success. On the 2nd of July, Tracy told her that she was looking after her uncle in Cricklewood. She said she's returning either the 4th or the 9th of July, depending, you know, on this uncle's health. On the 9th of July, the social worker made contact with Tracy and she was, you know, back home this time. 
and she was actually at a walking clinic yet again for Peter, of course. At a home visit that same day, the social worker saw all the children and Peter's ear appeared to be very red and very sore. Now we're going to be going on to our final part of the video. It's the final two weeks of the lead up before the horrific death of baby Peter. So, you know, just another little trigger warning quick. So this is 18th of July to the 3rd of August and these are like the final recorded events and the big huge just oh it's awful on the 18th of july tracy and baby p were seen at the clinic by a health visitor peter's weight had actually reduced to the 25th centile which is very bad and he had been seen at the walking clinic on 9th of july and treated with cream for his head scabs it was noted that peter was on a child protection plan and was he, he appeared to be well groomed, well nourished, and there was no unexplained physical injuries. He'd also been given antibiotics for an ear infection. Clearly, she keeps doing something to his ears. His left ear was red on the outside, and the and the lobe appeared to be infected. On the 19th of July, the next day, Tracy took him again to the walking centre where he was referred to A&E. A history was taken, and he was assessed and described as alert and looking around. I mean, that's not really. What does that say about anyone? Like what? He had an infected scalp with bloody scabs, a head lice and blood around the left ear where he'd been scratching because obviously he was uncomfortable. He looked grubby and his middle finger of his right hand was infected in the nail bed. The infection was not investigated by doctors. A&E decided to phone the emergency duty team. On the 23rd of July, the childminder just phoned the social worker and said to her that she's no longer able to take care of Peter and the other siblings because Peter has head lice and a scalp infection. It's catching. Anyway, the social worker phoned Tracy and expressed her concern that this ear infection was taking way too long to clear up and she should go back to the GP. According to Tracy, the doctor was not concerned and couldn't prescribe him anything else and that he suggested it may be a allergic reaction to the head lice treatment. GP recognised the need for concern but did nothing as he thought others would do something. That seems to be a really strange thing that people do like why is a healthcare professional saying oh I'm not going to step in because you know someone else will do it. It's just so stupid when a child's involved. On the 25th of July the legal planning meeting took place and it was actually decided that the case no longer met the threshold of the care proceedings so basically saying like Oh, he's not in as much he's not in that much danger like it doesn't matter but however the position should be reviewed in light of further reports on the 31st of july the police met with the crown prosecution services cps who advised no further action on the investigation i mean come on cps what are you doing what the hell that just shot oh my god it just shocks me on the 1st of august tracy took peter to a cdc appointment accompanied by a family friend and the doctor took this to be the foster carer of peter the referral had made clear that peter was on the child protection register but was not the focus of current inquiries for injuries peter was seen to be unwell with a temperature and a runny nose and he had visible bruises tracy shared her concerns about his behavior tracy became tearful when she said that cps had accused her of causing harm to her baby peter i mean she had but and his weight was now in fact down on the ninth centile which is so bad a considerable weight loss from the last time he was seen the doctor concluded that he was unwell and you know a bit grumpy miserable due to a possible viral infection he had a history of reoccurring bruises reoccurring infections and he also had some abnormal reoccurring behavior like hyperactivity head banging aggression just strange behavior i mean i don't blame him so remember guys this was the first the first of august okay the first and this doctor said he's just a bit grumpy because of viral infection anyway i'm gonna get back to that the second of august tracy was seen by the police at the social service offices was told that neither prosecutions would be pursued i mean come on and then on the third of august the next day the london ambulance services respond to a 911 call from tracy at 11 35 a.m in the morning she reported that her 17 month old child who was now not moving 
and was on antibiotics. She reported to the crew that she'd last seen him in his cot at about 1am and he seemed clearly ill spluttering and when the ambulance crew arrived it was clear it, it it wasn't normal this scene it wasn't an accidental death he was in a cot with splattered blood everywhere and he was just in his nappy nothing else and he was completely lifeless they wanted to it was it was a baby they wanted to rush him into the ambulance get him to the hospital even though he was lifeless they were trying to resuscitate him, trying to do something to get him back to life. Tracy travelled in an ambulance with Peter to the hospital and he was very sadly pronounced dead at 12.19pm. So ambulance crew stated that it was clear Peter had been dead for some time before they were called and even more ridiculous, Tracy, okay, this mum of her little boy that has just died was more concerned about herself. She was going to like, oh, can you wait a sec? Like, hang on, I want to get my hairbrush. I need to do my hair. Oh, I need to get my cigarettes. Huh? Your baby's dead. They're taking him to the in an ambulance. Your baby is dead and you're more worried about what your hair looks like and if you have cigarettes. It was actually discovered a few days prior, just before they went and saw the doctor that said it was just, you know, it was just a bit grumpy. Turned out that his spine had been snapped in half apparently by her boyfriend Stephen and apparently to use this much force it's compared to the same amount of force as a car crash on that little beautiful boy's body oh and he also had several broken ribs and it's an actual fact that children's ribs are actually quite hard to break it was actually said the day he died he was screaming in his cot because he'd been covered in poo and wee for days his body couldn't do functions properly because he's, he was paralysed because of his spinal injury calls to him. He was literally paralysed. So anyway, Stephen thought, oh, I'll sort him out. Went into the room and punched him in his head, his cheek, so hard that he actually ended up swallowing his own tooth, which was later found in his stomach in the post-mortem. I wish I could... Oh, God. And this was all apparent. This was all there. When he was assessed by that consultant who is meant to be an expert and apparently they did not notice the obvious injury. I mean, come on. Tracy got arrested that day, like literally straight after because it was so obvious that it was a case of child abuse. I mean, it really could not have been anything else, let's be honest. And even sicker, she was currently pregnant with her fifth child because clearly she deserved another child. She just loves kids so much, don't she? Bless her. By the time the ambulance had arrived, Jason Owen and Stephen Barker, including Jason Owen's 15-year-old um, girlfriend, who were living with them for a couple of months before baby Peter's death, they'd already fled the scene, you know? They they knew, some, you know, there was going to be there's going to be some repercussions, obviously. And they had disposed of Peter's bloodied sheets and other evidence, and they went on the run, basically. And they were eventually found 11 days later at a campsite near Epping Forest, and they were actually reported by one of the people that worked at this campsite and they had a stash of weapons and all items of clothing owned by Peter were found by the police, bloodstained, like literally all of them. So sad. I'm going to talk you through now what injuries he had, the horrific injuries. And it is said that his death was caused by his spinal injury and the internal bleeding caused by it. And he basically just, he passed away from this sick, no, he was, I'm sorry, he was murdered. I don't. I don't care what the verdict was, he was murdered by sick, disgusting people. He had severe cuts to the top of his, his head, including wounds from a dog or human bite, but it's assumed to be um, a dog bite because they actually trained their Rottweiler to attack and bite baby Peter. What the hell, man? What the hell? He had three bruises on his forehead, skin missing on his nose, bruising on his left temple and above his left ear, bruising on his right cheek, broken back and bleeding around the spine at the neck and this was around 48 hours old imagine the pain he was in oh my god it left ear was ripped so it was literally coming away from his head cuts on the front and the back of his neck and beneath his chin blackened finger and toenails one finger missing now and tip had been stripped of their skin on purpose skin missing from lips and tongue clearly from a blow to the, that area eight broken ribs between one and two weeks old. Oh my god, the hell this poor baby's been through. Three faint bruises on his chest, skin between upper lip and gum torn, front tooth knocked out, faint bruise on lower back, old fracture to shin bone that 
never no all all these times he went to the consultant the a and &E, and no one saw this old shin bone injury how small bruises on the toe so clearly this poor baby boy he was horrifically tortured and abused by his own mother and his own mother's sick twisted boyfriend at this point all three of the perpetrators so his mum tracy Connolly, stephen barker the boyfriend and stephen barker's brother jason owen were all charged with causing or allowing the death of a child and murder they all pleaded not guilty to murder and at this point all three are charged with causing or allowing the death of a child they all pleaded not guilty to murder However, also, Jason Owen and Stephen Barker also pleaded not guilty to causing or allowing the death to a child. But at this point, Tracy had kind of been like, oh, well, I need, I need to pick one charge. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pick that one because it's the lesser of the two evils, isn't it? Letting your child die instead of murdering them. So she actually pleaded guilty to this charge. In fact, during questioning... Jason Owen said that the day that Peter died, he actually went into the room and saw his brother, Stephen Barker, looking excited and sweaty whilst seeing Peter lifeless in his car. Stephen completely denies this, saying that he's never laid a finger on Peter. I mean, come on. There's so much evidence. The trial commenced at the Old Bailey at the end of 2008 during this the murder charges against jason owen and tracy Connolly were dropped due to insufficient evidence i'm sorry but when it's this disgusting you murdered that baby yeah you did you didn't like you didn't you know shoot him in the head and kill him on the spot but you murdered him that is murder in my eyes of course during the trial all three all turned against each other completely blaming on the other person to try and get themselves off the hook make themselves look a bit better and they just turned against each other like they always do and tracy said that she had no idea that peter was suffering her love her baby was suffering this horrendous abuse by her own boyfriend like she just didn't know come on stupid woman and it was actually said that whilst the jewelry was out she was playing with her hair looking very bored just you know wanting to get out there like just you know like so like ugh. and then as soon as the jury walked back in she was you know turning on the waterworks dabbing at her eyes a little bit looking very anxious it was a complete like act obviously and the jury was actually shown a computer generated image of the injuries that baby peter sustained now they didn't want to show the real images and these aren't available to anybody to see which i'm quite glad i don't think anyone should see that and i do understand why they did show computer generated ones instead of the real ones that does make a bit of sense however i feel like i don't know it's it, you know in, in america they would have showed the real photos because it makes you understand more when it's computer generated it takes it i mean it's not a, it's not the real photos but then again i see why they did that because it is so traumatizing it's a child it's a baby it's not even a child it's a baby stephen barker was found not guilty of murdering Peter, but him and Owen were found guilty of causing or allowing a child's death. The two brothers actually appeared in court again in April 2009, and this is just disgusting. They allegedly anally put a two year old girl. I mean, what? What? This apparently was before baby Peter's death, and it's unknown who this girl is. However, she did live in the residence with them all and i mean it's pretty clear this is one of um baby peter's slightly older siblings obviously they had a very close age gap because she had the kids so close to each other she said that stephen barker raped her many times in her own mum's bedroom and the sickest fact was that tracy used to even witness this and she'd just be like oh stop it huh that's your baby well, assuming it's her baby. I mean, it's not really going to be anyone else. There's no other two-year-olds living in that house. And it actually turns out this two-year-old girl is the youngest sexual abuse victim to give evidence at the Bailey. What an ama- Oh, this little girl, man. Oh. She told the call, I was asleep and he woke me up. He was being naughty. He pulled my clothes down. Oh my God. Can't. What a brave little girl. Two years old. I mean, she must have been a little bit older at this point, maybe. But wow. Wow. Poor girl, Jesus Christ. 
sentencing for both trials took place in May 22nd, 2009. Before the trial was sentenced, um, Tracy actually decided to write a ham return letter from her cell in Holloway Prison to the judge. And this really heartfelt note, mm, yeah, okay, let, let, let's just read it. Some of it's blanked out anyway, by the way. Dear judge, I am writing this letter as I'm not sure of a better way to express my regret. I accept I fouled my son Peter, for which I have pleaded guilty. By not fully by not being fully open with the social workers, I stopped them from being able to do a full job. As a direct result of this, my son got hurt and sadly lost his short life. I'm never going to see my lovely son grow into the lovely sweet man I believed he could have been. Oh my god. Anyway, I've lost all I hold dear to me. Now every day of my life is full of guilt and trying to come to terms with my failure as a mother. I punish myself on a daily basis and there is not a day that goes by where I don't cry at some point. Again, this is all about her. It's so, so about her. Her like, oh, well, I, I'm at least, at least I'm pleading guilty to, you know, allowing it to happen. But I remember I'm not a murderer. Be nice, be nice, be nice at my trial. It's literally like she's doing that and I, it's sickening, honestly sickening. Anyway, the judge thought it was all, you know, gobbledygook. He didn't believe a word he, she said. And in fact, he called her a selfish, calculating and manipulative human being. He said that she was so selfish and only cared about her own relationship with Stephen Barker instead of her children. Now, guys, this is where the sentencing, I'm going to be talking about sentencing. You are actually going to be in severe shock. Tracy received an indefinite prison sentence with a minimum term of five years. But five years i know indefinite could mean forever but come on whenever is it it's not minimum five years Mi minimum what uh, uh, that i mm. why do they take fraud cases so seriously tiny little fraud cases they get years in prison but a literal mum who killed her baby gets a minimum of five years <sighs> stephen barker was sentenced to life in prison for the rape conviction with a minimum of 10 years still not enough and he also got 12 years for his role in baby peter's death and his brother jason owen was sentenced to life in prison indefinitely with having to serve at least three years to be honest he didn't really care what the hell was going on as long as he didn't get caught about his relationship with his 15 year old girlfriend the UK was obviously in complete uproar about this. They were furious. There was literally like people holding up signs, protesting as they should. And these three still had the absolute cheek to go on and appeal their sentences. Like, come on, come on. You got barely anything for what you did. Cheek of it. Anyway, Owen's sentence was changed to six years, a fixed term of six years. So he actually came out worse. He got a bigger sentence. And all three have never taken responsibility. They've never admitted, they've never showed remorse. Although obviously the mum has, but it's very fake and manipulative. They were made aware their public protection would be limited because they are child killers and they were going to have new identities. This really bugs me. Why are you being released and allowed to have new identities? I'm sorry, if you've killed a child, let the public go at them. Sorry, I'm just saying. Anyway, guys, are you ready for this? Tracy originally gets released in 2013. Okay. Keep in mind, she was convicted in, wait for it, 2009? That's when her sentence was put. Her sentence was put in 2009. She's released in 2013. 2013. For literally doing that to her baby. Oh my god. She actually got sent back two years later in 2015 for breaching her parole rules, terms of her parole, because she was actually selling nude photos of herself online. I mean, no offence. Who would want to buy them? Just saying. And after being returned to prison, she was refused parole in 2015, 2017 and 2019. And then finally, in 2022, her parole hearing was successful. She was gonna be released. Man, that is still nowhere near enough time. Nowhere near. She was meant to be let out in the May, but Justice Security Dominic Robb tried to block her release, thank God. Anyway, it didn't work, and she was released in July. She's literally walking about. She's walking free to do whatever on earth she wants. I'm in shock. What is wrong with the justice system? What the hell? Jason Owen was released in 2013. He went back to jail due to breaching his rules, but he's back out now and he's assumed to be living under a new identity. And Stephen Barker is still in prison and apparently in prison he is completely denying 
any rehabilitation programs, making himself better, treatment programs, and he was denied in 2021 for parole due to this because he's not taking any responsibility or confronting his crimes. Anyway, there was actually a serious case opened into this whole complete misjustice. Oh my God. So it was due to the police failure, social services failures, medical failures, and Haringey, Haringey Council actually already had been found negligent of another child, which is another big case in the UK, Victoria Climate. I think I'm saying that right. No lessons were learnt here. I mean, come on. Sharon Shoe Smith was the local authorities director of the children's services and she was actually fired thank god and several other people in a part of this case were sacked. They were dismissed, thank god. And I I'm sure I want to say things have improved, things have changed, but I I feel like some cases yeah, but some cases no. There still needs to be more done even since his death. Oh this pains me and I could talk about it all day, I could rant all day, but I just wanted to give you the case and, you know, give you the details, all discussed in the comments. I would love to hear your opinions and, you know, we can get in our little, we can have discussions in the comments and, yeah. But this is just a tre tremendously disgusting, horrible, depressing case and I, that poor baby, anyway. Oh. I really hope you enjoyed this video, not obviously the horrendous story but me sharing more awareness on it and i really hope you enjoyed it and if you did give it a big like and subscribe and i will see you all very shortly hopefully next week for another true crime video i love you all so much bye